Hey, everyone. We're live, pal. Two weeks in a row, Andrew. We have not missed in two weeks, which is a a record for us these days. But (laughs) uh, we have a lot of stuff to talk about, including AEW Revolution. But where are you with this pay-per-view? Like one out of ten. What is your expect? Are you excited? Like it's not like we don't see wrestling multiple times every week. So I feel like that question is a little bit different these days than when we were growing up. But uh, big pay-per-view coming up here. Yeah, I, I'm excited. I think it's going to be great. You know, uh, Sting is not someone I got to see live too much, being a a fed head, as someone called me the other day. Uh, wow. Growing up in the Northeast, you didn't really get to see Sting t- that often. I, 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 It wasn't until much later I got to, I think it was like 98, I saw Sting for the first time uh when they came to the coliseum i'm not even sure if he was still on that i i barely went to any wcw shows but the fact that you know in the recent years i've seen him a whole lot with aew has been really cool i got to see him at world's end uh you know which was the last time i saw him i i I, i'm into this i and i think a lot of people surprisingly are into it more than people thought the way that sting's retirement match was hyped was nothing like they did with Flair. You know, Flair was a big event for that show, or even like Ricky Steamboat. You know, they had uh, a story of it. Not not on the same level, but I think the Flair one is is something to talk about because they did a great job with selling that show. With Sting, it was kind of like on the, on the back burner when they first announced it, and it sold out immediately, which is amazing to see, you know, in the Coliseum. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I'm super. I'm super excited to see it. As an aside... When people call WWE the Fed, does that bother you at all? Uh, when has WWE I, I been the Fed? Not in 20 years, I don't think. I mean, they're still the Fed to me. Uh, you, yeah. How often do you slip up and call it WWF? Almost never now. I, I actually yeah, have I, the reverse problem in that if I'm, I'm doing like a history thing on the old, you know, 90s or 80s or 90s, I miss call it wwe instead of wwf you know i i still call it turner you know it's still turner to me <laughs> i call city field shay i'm not even kidding you. <laughs> i'm not even kidding you and i don't even do it with like a slip it's just i refuse to call the city field if whenever like my wife's like what are you doing tonight are you coming home after work i'm like no i'm going to city i'm going to shay you know i'll i'll it just you know i'm, I'm stuck in my ways I WWE will always be the Fed to me. It's always WWF to me. Uh, the same as you know TBS and TNT and whatever Warner is. If it's wrestling related, it's Turner. Uh, people internally call it Turner at, at at WBD. You know, it's part of the lingo, I guess. By the way, I'm getting all of these like little messages about some tweets that you made today. There's one of yeah. like some. Is that fire? I, I don't even know what that I is. Talk, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, my gosh. And then there was another one, but I don't see it in your feed anymore. Shh, don't enough? talk about it. All right. All right. Just uh, I don't know, man. When when I don't know I... where things are going, they must be secret, <laughs> secret with you. I, 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 I'll text you. I'll text it to you. How about that? Okay. All right. I'm in. Okay. Right. So I just sent it to you. I just sent it to you. Take a look before we All move right. on. Don't you dare share oh. it. Oh, there we go. Okay, I, I get it now. Isn't that cool? Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. Uh, so as we uh, as we were talking about the Fed thing, I it seems like it's now an insult. It's like if you are an old school WWF fan, then current wrestling fans who watch a bunch of different things, they call it the Fed as if to say that you are sort of out of touch and old school. Do you get that sense as well? Or is that just me reading into things? I don't know. I, I, I don't think out of touch. Uh, old school, sure. You know, it's what we grew up on. Uh, I don't think I don't think out of touch at all. OK, you know, good. people want to call it that. Uh, call it whatever the hell you want. You know, you want to people call it New York. Yeah, true. Titan. If someone still calls it Titan, that'd be crazy. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about some revolution. Yeah. Now, this thing is built entirely around Sting, like you said. And I find the dynamic to be super interesting. You know what I watched the other day? And I watched it because 
uh, myself and my buddy John LaRocca are doing a wrestling movie review podcast once a month. We yeah. watched Ready to Rumble, the David Arquette WCW movie from, I think it's the year 2000. And Sting is like the baby face in that. Like he's like, he's, he's not the true baby face, but he's like the cameo baby face in that movie. And I looked at that dude and I was like, you know what? This movie's like 24 years ago or whatever. He almost looks the same behind that face paint. He's not yeah. wearing the he's not wearing the onesie anymore, but he's you know it's like God the guy almost looks the same. What what face paint and staying in in pretty decent shape for somebody who we know at times in his life has been in like absolutely tremendous shape. Like he he it, the character still works, and kudos to Sting. For being able to go through the late 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, and now the 2020s. And still, like, you know, he is he he's probably not a bigger overall mainstream star than ever. But I don't know. When's the last time a Sting match sold 16,000 tickets? I, I Never, I don't right? Know when it ever did. I don't know when it ever did. Yeah. I, I you know, he is fascinating to me because he was growing up for me because they were a couple years older than me. For me, he was like the counter to what WWE was doing. You know, like to the Ultimate Warrior, he was the counter. To the Hulk Hogan, he was the counter. Um, I, I have a very different perspective, and I wish I had a different perspective than I do about Sting and his career and access to seeing him wrestle. Um, I think it's it's actually fascinating, and it tells you something about the reach that you know, he's had in his career that they were able to sell that show so quickly. I had some family in town. Well, not my family, but my wife's extended family. And they're from uh, a small town in North Carolina called Gastonia. Actually, for basketball fans, the hometown of big game James Worthy, Gastonia. and. I was asking her, I was like, how far is Greensboro from where you live? And she said it was like an hour and a half or so. And I was like, yeah, there was a sm like when this card got announced and when this was Sting's final match, I, there was like this small wanting for me to go to this show. And I could have stayed somewhere. But you know, at the end of the day, doing doing something like that in March is, is kind of crazy. So I, I didn't even really think twice about it. But like even me, it's like. I was kind of like, oh, man, I wasn't like Sting wasn't even my guy. Lee Hogan was my guy. Um, Nature Boy was my guy. So Sting was kind of next. But still, like there was just I, I just think this whole idea uh, of what they've done here is, is intriguing, especially for old school fed guys like us. Right. Yeah. Like that is going back to our childhood when we would have first seen Sting. Yeah, I. When was the first time you saw him? Like, what was the first memory or, or feud you have of Sting? Starcade 1987. Wow. Which is the infamous Starcade because WWE sabotaged them on pay per view by creating the Survivor Series. And so I'm not into the NWA that much at that point because I'm like, I, I'm probably like 11 years old. But I'm big time into WWF. It's, you know, Hogan and Andre are getting in the ring together at the Survivor Series. I want to watch that show. So I, I have my dad give a tape to one of his friends who's got the black box and she records it, sends it back to me. I get it like that night and I have to go to bed, but I just wanted to make sure that the tape worked and I pop it in and it's Starcade 87. And I was like, what the hell is this? This is not the Survivor yeah. Series. <laughs> what but, a disappointment. <laughs> right. But. At the same time, it was probably the best thing that ever happened for my wrestling fandom because I must have watched that tape 50 times. And so I got to learn about all of those guys. And Sting is on the is in the opening match in a in a, 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 a six man tag. I think I think that's the opening match. Sting and Rick Steiner are both in that opening tag. So, uh, yeah, so that's when I would have seen him. And I'm like, oh, who's you know, who's this jacked up guy with face paint? So uh, that, I, that was I would my first memory. I would. Um... I I I I'm trying to think back. It's mine is way later. Mine is probably uh like ninety one ish. That would probably be my first like memory of Sting. Mm -hmm. 
because WCW, again, it wasn't something I really watched. My grandmother was a big fan of Ric Flair, so she would put it on, but I was too little, you know? Uh, my first memories of wrestling are always WWF, but, like, if I was going to say my first Sting memories, probably, no, you know what, 1990. 89, 90, probably more like 90 was my memory of, of Sting. And I thought well, it was, uh, you know. That's uh, his first title run. Yeah, yeah, around then. That, that probably was it. That's also, and we can kind of segue ever so slightly just to pay our respects to uh ole anderson and you know dave dave did a a 30 minute like just historical uh bio on ole this this morning so anybody who wants to know about ole it's the the observer and dave and brian talking uh, last night this morning uh, fantastic there's i couldn't do it anywhere close to the justice but it just reminded me because Ole Anderson was the booker when Sting won the world title, and he was the voice of the Black Scorpion. That's people our age who were, you know, maybe not as big of fans in, in the 70s and 80s. That's how we would have remembered him. A, part of the Four Horsemen, then, but then B, <laughs> the Black Scorpion angle. That's the one that... Yeah. Well, I remember the Black Scorpion most. stuff. Uh, I remember his feud with Flair. So that would probably have been like late 89. Mm -hmm. um a ton of memories of like rick rude and uh vader and like that whole run uh from like 91 to like 93 really big memories of yes yes so um let's talk a little bit about this card i was looking at this card and i know the diehard AEW fans are very excited for this show i think it's a good show just match for match, I'm not sure if it's like one of their iconic shows, at least on paper. But other than the Sting retirement match, what's the thing that you're looking most forward to? Because I'm guessing that we are going to differ in in what we are looking most forward to after the Sting match. Um, I I would probably see the world title. Um. Daniel, uh, you know what? I'm sorry. Danielson and uh, and Kingston, 100%. That's probably second, and then the world title third. Okay, so we, we sort of agree. I, I the, okay, Eddie Kingston and Danielson, that is next on my list. I'm cold on this world title feud, man. I'm really cold on it. And you know, we were talking about this, the rise of Swerve. And I, he's one of the guys to me that you need to build around. But adding Hangman into this feud and making it a three way, I think it's ruining it for me. I would rather see a Joe versus Swerve match one on one for one reason. I like world title matches to be one on one anyways. But I understand if you're not ready to take the belt off of Samoa Joe, because I actually think he's done a tremendous, tremendous job as champion then maybe you don't want to pin Swerve. Like, that makes sense to me. But I don't know. If if we're not ready to pull the trigger on Swerve, I'm not sure that he should have been in this match necessarily. Uh, I, just, I just think, you know, how can you build up more anticipation for him than what they did at the end of last year? And I think extending it through March has kind of muted him a bit, unfortunately. Uh, and you know, it's, it's kind of funny because I hearken back to when we were talking about Cody Rhodes losing to Roman Reigns last year at WrestleMania. And we were like, Oh my God, I can't believe they did this. What happens if Cody is, you know, ruined or whatever, what happens if his popularity just goes way down? Um, I were wrong. We were wrong because Cody is hotter than he's ever been. So yeah. maybe Swerve can can lose this match, but I just don't sense that they're gonna do a year long storyline <laughs> to get to get him back. Um, no, so I, I so, had a conversation with someone about this, and and my first thing was he can't ever eat that pin in that match. Yeah, he can't. You know, Swerve I, I cannot I be the one so. that eats that pin. I don't think so. But then again, if we go back to the Cody thing, where he did eat the pin and. They just continue to build him up. So there is an avenue for that. I just don't sense that that is the story for Swerve here. But um, 
I would have either pulled the trigger with him, which is unfortunate for Joe because I think Joe's great, or just do Hangman and Joe and Swerve somehow gets screwed out of the match and then he gets it for double or nothing. That's what how I would have preferred to do it. But so yeah. that's why I'm a little bit down on that. Um, and I guess I would say after that, just match for match sake, I just want to see Osprey. I don't like the booking against Takeshita, though, because Takeshita is another guy that I see that they're sort of slowly rebuilding. Remember after he came in early on and he was like losing all these matches and we're like, man, when's Takeshita going to get a win? And then all of a sudden he's beaten everybody. And now you're bringing in Will Ospreay, who to me needs to be one of the top three talents that AEW pushes in 2024. I think he's just, you know, if Tony Khan can take this dude and make him one of the top stars in wrestling, that is a bonus for Tony Khan's ability to create stars. It's a lot of it. Most of it's going to be Will, but just to put him in those positions, yeah. because Will is so unique. And when you get the guy who is considered the best in ring, like he's at least going to be the best in ring. Now, how do we make him a, a much bigger star? Which is why I think we both were kind of like intrigued at him going to WWE. But that's like, so you can't beat Will in his first match back. Um, and, you know, really as a member of the the company, a, member, a talent in the company. But also Takeshi is hot as, you know, hot as he's been. And I would hate to see him. Lose. So I don't really like the booking in this match yeah. of itself. But at the same time, from an in-ring perspective, it should probably be amazing. Yeah, I, I think the overall, the entire show is going to be nice. Um, I, you know, they, they don't really miss on a pay-per-view. It's it's rare, right? I, I think I could only think of two shows that I've counted that were like bad one was pre-pandemic and one was, I think, recently. That was one AEW pay-per-view that wasn't, you know, great. But, you know, you're doing, they're going to be doing 10, 11 to 12 uh, shows a, a year with with um, probably 12 with Ring of Honor now. But, mm -hmm. you know, the more shows you add, the, the more of an opportunity it is to have a, have a miss. But they generally don't miss on these. Yeah. It should be... It should be a pretty, I would say, uh, the last couple of pay-per-views have been on the lesser side from like a show perspective that, than usual. Yeah. Um, and this is a good opportunity for them to start off a really hot sort of like spring to summer because you, they have so many things that are coming. We have big business that's coming. Osprey is now in. At some point, Okada is going to be in. There's, I'm sure Tony Khan has things up his sleeve that are coming that fans are going to be really excited about. Uh, and they need to, you know, they need to do that. They need to create more interest because we got to get those ticket sales up. You know, those pay per views are going to yeah. be really solid. They got a TV deal to to ink in. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that if this show is excellent, it'll be a good kickoff to what should be um, a very interesting year for them. Yeah, no, I, I think the second half of this year is going to be very telling of the trajectory of this company. We've seen the moves that they've made. You know, they hired a writer. Uh, they're looking to expand the pay-per-view schedule. They uh, have Forbidden Door here in Arthur Ashe, which is a big deal to me, <laughs> you know. Uh, the CMLL partnership, this is all part of the the... Tony's big plan for this year. Uh, and so far, it's been a good year. I mean, I, I think the wrestling has been solid. I think the TV has been really good. It's just getting back on that positive uh, perspective train for mm -hmm. where they're headed. I, I think a lot of it, you know, optics matter, right? We talk about that all the time. And 2023 was a bad year for them. Between the injuries and punk and the negativity regarding their shows, uh, the uncertainty where they're landing for their TV show, which I still stand by. They're going to stay on WBD. Um, it's just a lot of conversation about what's going on with it. But we also have to remember, this is still a startup. They're five years old. They're not a 60-year-old conglomerate that's worth billions and billions of dollars. So I, I think it's a very 
uneven comparison when people are talking about WWE and AEW. You can't look at it as if it's it's a similar or same product at all. You have to look at everything individually. Yeah, is there fair criticism of, of that company, of AEW? Sure. Uh, most of it is very fair criticism. Uh, we talk about it every week on the show. Dave has been very vocal with you, especially on Observer, on Observer Radio. I, I, I think right now, this year, uh, very important to them. And they're very much aware. What do you think? And I, I've probably asked you this question a couple of different times, but I checked back in with Collision this week because when the NFL playoffs and then there was NBA All-Star Weekend and I was, you know, just 100% in on the Niners and, you know, I'm doing podcasts on on that stuff too. I just let coll Collision lapse for like a month and then I went back to it on saturday and for like the first i would say for the first hour and 15 minutes outside of moxley's promo and maybe danielson's promo i was like show's kind of boring like like you're asking people on a saturday evening to sit down and and watch this show when nothing is really happening and then the last 45 minutes of that show i think were, were pretty darn good but man, how do people sit there and just watch wrestling on a Saturday with everything else that's going on in, in their world, everything else that's on television? Uh, I, I mean, maybe people are kind of pulling back on on going out as much or whatever. That could be. The, but I just watched that show and I was like, how? How do people just watch that show live on a consistent basis? Do I mean, some in some instances, people just love wrestling so much. And yeah. that show is not hard to watch. But if you look at Dynamite, and the reason why I watch Dynamite, or at least try to watch it live, is because things happen. Something happens on that show. And on Collision, yeah. I was like, man, there's nothing going on. What, like, what would be the reason for me to make sure that I watch every evening uh, or every Saturday evening um, without fail? Like, there's nothing. There wasn't anything. Like, I could have watched that Danielson and Jun Akiyama match. I, I actually watched it on Monday. So... That, that's how I watched it. Just, I don't know. I, I just find that show to be, I'm not sure. I can't under, I don't understand what the strategy is with that show. Um, well, originally the, the strategy was to eliminate dark and dark elevation, dark and is it dark elevation or is it elevation? Dark elevation. I thought dark elevation, <laughs> dark <laughs> and dark elevation. Okay. Uh, it was because they were eliminating those shows and they wanted another show for the talent that's not getting on dynamite to have an avenue because rampage was getting more of the dynamite stuff so they wanted another product to put content i mean originally i was told it was going to be a one hour show on saturdays with the t with the concept of a six o'clock time slot which would have been awesome and i was kind of hinting like listen you know if you're trying to get a newer generation of viewership you know, uh, I came up in the Saturday afternoon generation where that's what that's how I got introduced to WWF. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a nice avenue to pick up a younger demo that's not staying up at eight o'clock or 10 o'clock to watch a product. But that evolved, right? It, that evolved into the CM Punk show and it became an A1 branded show. I think that's very difficult to do, especially mm -hmm. when one product is struggling a little bit with injuries and everything else that's going on. But CM Punk was enough for them. Uh, they shifted into that. I think now they're just reverting a little bit back to what the original concept might have been. You know, get talent on there, have them do these matches, uh, and, and just to display, you know, extend storylines or, or display, you know, whatever someone is able to do. You know, it, to me, it just seems like it's FTR and House of Black and then, and then a bunch of squash matches now, <laughs> which I don't hate. I don't hate it at all. Like, I love the fact that I could watch a Jun Akiyama and Brian Danielson match on a Saturday night. I like that show because it fits my need. I don't go out on Saturday nights. Mm -hmm. It's amateur hour. I don't go out on Friday nights. You know what I go out? Wednesday and Thursday. Those are my nights out. So for me, wrestling is great on a Saturday night. I get it, though. It's very difficult. You know, and that's why there are under 400,000 people this week. Not a good yes. rating. Yes, but that's that, their core. They they'll always have that as their core audience. Now, some of that is the chamber, obviously. Even though, of course, you know, I think, yeah, I think every I think almost everybody watched that chamber show on some sort of delay. 
And so then it's how much wrestling do you want to watch after that? And like I said, I got through it on, I watched some of it on Sunday and, and the rest of it on Monday. So yeah. I did get through it, but that's because I feel like, you know, doing this show, talking to Dave, more often than not, I'd like to be up to speed on it just in case. And like you said, there, Danielson and Akiyama was really fun. And the whole thing yeah. with Eddie and, and Danielson, and if you're listening to the commentary, that stuff is fun. I, I guess my worry is, is just at, at, at what is the, what do you think is the floor for that show? Because we can always say, you know, during college football season, they're always going to have competition. Now it's, you know, WWE's pay-per-views and it's US, UFC's Saturday shows and it's the NBA and then it's going to be Major League Baseball. So they're always going to have something competing. They're never going to have a Saturday by themselves. I just worry about what happens when you get you you miss a week and then you just see those numbers for the normalized week just go down slightly. Like, what is the floor yeah. for a show like that? That would be a little bit of a worry for me, but I, I I know there are hardcore fans. I see it in my Discord every week. There are people watching Collision live every week. I know there is a hardcore base of fans there. Uh, so someone maybe, that maybe it's all to do about to. nothing for me. Something someone that I'm very close to that is in the totally in the know with TV. Okay, nothing to do with wrestling, but in the know with TV told me. If they are able to get over 600,000 viewers consistently for that show, that is a tremendous success. Tremendous. Doesn't have anything to do with what they're putting on TV. The fact that they are uh, at a Saturday night wrestling show uh, on, on cable is just where they... Uh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, no. On? Oh, nothing. Uh, <laughs> AW dropped <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Sorry, I was a little distracted because uh, there's a lot of hoopla with this new AW logo. Yes, a lot of there hoopla, and all I, of a sudden, I posted a teaser. Time. I sent you, I sent it to you. You saw yes, it, but AW also it. put it on their website, and it's a variant of the one that I showed you. Yes, it, it, it's similar, but it's not exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah, it's not exactly the same. It's the same font, just a different look. Um, I'm sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> <laughs> no, you were you were talking about six hundred thousand for collision. Yeah, so I, I was told if they're able to get six hundred thousand viewers consistently, you know, not yeah. I'm not saying a big like you put on a big main event and it pops a number. That is an astronomical success on a Friday night. Yeah. You know, they're in the fours. Sometimes they're in the fives. Um, NXT was the same thing. I was always told that USA couldn't like if they when they were hitting in the 600s, uh, that was their number. I mean, they're still in the sixes, 650, 700 on like a really good week. If it's like a special world, you know, they're putting the title online, maybe a 720. I was that is a very good number for cable. We have to stop thinking about cable like it's 1998. Mm -hmm. Same for WWE. WWE is a monster right now. These numbers that they are doing is unbelievable. Look at that key demo, a 0.7 is crazy yep that smackdown segment had a what was it a one two something highest rated uh, demo that they've had in over a decade oh you're talking about for the rock and roman segment for the rock yeah 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 no it's it's and, and just to think of where we are with wrestling fox is like sorry guys it's still not good enough for us you can go back to the usa channel um, yeah, when you can pull numbers like that. All right, just quickly go over the rest of the card. We have Cassidy against Roddy Strong. Uh, we have uh, Timeless Tony against Deanna Peraza. So that, that should be a good... I, I hope Tony kind of shakes the gimmick a little bit mid-match and, and they have a really good wrestling match. Uh, also, Christian against Daniel Garcia, which is interesting because I think we thought maybe we would get the edge or Adam Copeland rematch, but instead we got Daniel Garcia, so he's going to have an opportunity to shine here. And then the Meat Madness match, Wardlow and Powerhouse Hobbs against Lance Archer, and then FTR versus uh, the Blackpool Combat Club, John Moxley and Claudio Castanoli. And I'm sure 
probably 14 more matches on the zero hour for uh for that show yeah not 14 probably like three so yeah should be a fun night or a fun weekend for wrestling and hope that everyone enjoys that show for those of you who are getting it let's switch some gears because you had some news that you had tweeted out about uh some shows that aew is going to be doing in the new york area yes uh forbidden door at arthur ash sometime late uh late january uh, january geez september i'm listing every month uh uh sometime in late june uh i'm going to i'm gonna guess this date okay i don't have a solid number I, i i haven't even asked and the person i'm gonna see i won't see for like another week um i'm gonna say the 23rd over the 30th which is a sunday in june mm-hmm. right, let me see june 30 23rd yeah i would say the 23rd is a better date than the 30th because the 30th the mets are playing and it'll be a total mess the mets have a one o'clock game which i would absolutely love to get loaded at a mets game for an afternoon game and then head on over right across the street to arthur ash stadium and go see wrestling uh but this is a big deal arthur ash is getting forbidden door it's a big stadium as far i mean it's a small stadium but big as far as the venues that they run they could fit about twenty thousand plus in that building and it's very possible that they could if that lineup is great i i i'm thrilled this is i was teasing this that i would be blown away by this when they announce it and when they do announce it i'm going to be even happier but it looks like this is where it's headed uh as far as grand slam goes i don't know it was originally going to be at louis armstrong stadium and uh, it seems like that is not the case. But so what I don't is, know where Grand Slam is entering. So, 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 the, so the, you, because they've done Grand Slam at Arthur Ashe the last couple years. So you're thinking, so that's, I'm assuming that's part of the reason why you thought it was going to be at, at Louis Armstrong, because it's in that same vicinity, right? Like that, those two yeah. stadiums are, are right next to each other. Yeah, right next to each other. One is 14,000, one is about 20-something thousand. Got it, got it. All right, so we'll have to wait and see on Grand Slam and and where that's going to be at. Man, you, there's just a crazy ruckus right now about this logo business. So I'm just I know, it's blowing up. Well, up I, everywhere. I, yeah, do you see it? It's everywhere now. Yes, it is. I think that's just a variant. It's not the main logo. I think that's just a, a color variant that they're using. Is it? Is it one. possible... That the one that that you showed me is the transparent, the transparent. It's, it's very possible. Yeah, it's very okay. possible. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let's talk about um, the elimination chamber here. We had like like we mentioned, the WWE PLE was Saturday morning at two a.m. for me, and I know some people who actually did watch it live on the West Coast, which is kind of ridiculous to me. But hey, I've watched. New Japan shows uh, around that time. So not, 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 I guess not as crazy. Uh, do, how, what was your viewing of this? When did you finally throw it on? At what, at what hour in on Saturday did you put it on? As soon as I got up at like six o'clock in the morning, I had it on. So you um, were almost it watched okay. it live. I was almost watching it live. I was a little delayed. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, 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 I thought it was okay um it was a show you know it was yeah. what was it like a two-match show or three-match show uh they got to where they needed to be obviously this was a great showing for Rhea at, in main eventing what a what a fantastic moment for her mm-hmm. but it was just to get things across you know along I I feel like the elimination chamber matches uh, it, there's so much you could do and they do all of it and then it just means nothing because they do it every <laughs> year yeah there was uh, an, uh I, there was no um super crazy athletic stuff. I, I guess Tiffany did something pretty athletic, but there was no like I, I remember I went to one live. This was in Oakland. It was early in the twenty tens, I think. And I think Johnny Nitro was in it. So like he's like scaling the the top of the cage, like he's Spider Man. Like there was none of that. It was yeah. On on one end, the women I thought told a great story. Is how are we going to get to Becky winning? And I thought uh, Tiffany got over big time. Liv got over in that match too, and it was great to see Raquel fight through, you know, the illness that she's dealing with, uh, and and wrestle. And she was on on Raw as well. 
Um, but yeah. you know, the whole vehicle was just to get to Becky and I thought Bianca was fantastic in that match. So the story was, you know, how do we get Becky to, to win this match? And, and everyone's trying to stop her from winning and such. So then on the men's side, I thought the men's match was like, how do we build towards high spots? <laughs> and like that's, the that's camera, what it was, yeah. the, the camera tricks were cool. And the way that they got to those high spots were cool. But when they were just doing the match, I was really bored during that match. But, you know, again, they had some really good high spots. But you really know what? Camera tricks. Think about it this way, right? If Punk was in the match, what would mm -hmm. the match have been? Because the story would have been that Punk's winning that, right? And he would face Seth Rollins night one and Cody and Roman would get night two or whatever, yeah. whatever it was going to be. A rock and Roman would get night two. Right. Now all of that went out the window. And I, I'm curious how this would have played out if that was the case, because night one is still in the air. We don't know what we're getting. Yes, it is very much so. And based on Raw from uh, Monday, Cody is still talking about it like it's him against The Rock. That is who he is still challenging to a one-on-one -on -one match. And Seth is kind of his backup. Seth is his bodyguard. He, they, so they're, I guess we're going to get The Rock on three, the next three SmackDowns. So they'll have an answer to Cody's challenge, I'm, sh I'm sure, uh, for that yeah. show. And maybe maybe build towards that tag match that, that we all think. Uh, let's go back to that Rhea match, though. Because I have seen some people say that that Rhea match was awesome. Almost to the point of like, not quite Hogan Andre levels, of course, because nothing can ever really be that famous, I don't think. But like, <laughs> that was the that was the idea, right? Like, this was Rhea toppling Andre in a sense. And I didn't see it like that in any way. And maybe it's because I don't like Nia uh, as a wrestler as much as some others do. I also didn't think the match was that good. I just, I thought I thought Nia was like pretty bad in that match on this big stage in this big moment, and Rhea was over, so it still worked in the end. But what did you, what was your takeaway? Did you like that match? Like a lot of people that I've seen, I thought it was fine. I I thought I liked it a little bit more because it was a great moment for Rhea, and I'm a fan yeah. of hers. Yeah. Um. So I, I was enjoying the fact that I was able to see this happen for her. And what a great moment that is for anybody. You know, you are a professional wrestler. You've been doing it since you were a teenager. Now you're headlining in your home country in front of 50,000 people. Tremendous. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Mm -hmm. But as far as, you know, a great pro wrestling main event, uh, it was fine. It was okay. It was whatever it was. I didn't, you know, would you say three stars? I don't think that's an insult. I think that's great. I think that's a very good score. Yeah, I would have probably gone a little bit less than that, but I think Maybe the pageantry less, yeah. does th the pageantry probably does pull it up that high because that is part of it. It is how does the live crowd react and the live crowd they were not going to let that match fail in any way, right? They were going to make sure that she was uh she was over that they were going to be loud for her, they were going to be there for all the moves. I just thought that Nia was bad. Like you remember in the Royal Rumble, Jade Cargill supposed to have this moment where she's going to body slam Nia. And I'm not saying Nia did this on purpose, but she sandbagged the body slam. She, I think she yeah. they mistimed it. Jade was about to do it, and then Nia kind of hopped a little early. So they didn't. it wasn't actually clean. And the same thing happened in this match. The first five minutes was all about Naya like and Rhea being on the wrong page on not not in stuff that I didn't think was that difficult to do. And so when that yeah. kind of thing happens, it, it frustrates me because and when you know the level of wrestler, you kind of give the benefit of the doubt to the person who you think is the better wrestler. So I was giving the benefit of the doubt to Rhea. Rhea's clearly the better wrestler. Rhea's had really, really good matches going all the way back to NXT. And so maybe I'm being a little hard on Nia. I just thought when you pick her for this moment, because look, she's in the main event of this giant 50,000 attendant show as well. So it's opportunity for her to shine. And then yeah. you watch it and you're like, oh, gosh, I can't believe they're like not getting some of these little 
small things right now you get to the end of it and it's fine and, and it's there and and you get to what you want to get to but i just i just was a little bothered by her performance and hey maybe maybe it was nerves or whatever because then i saw her the next night on raw and now i have a little bit of different perspective right because i was live at that show last night and you know fantastic seats the third row uh on the yeah. floor dead center so i got to see everything Nia Jax as a heel is a very entertaining heel from the perspective of facials, her attitude, how she just kind of like looks at the, her opponent as nothing. All of that stuff is great until she actually has to have the match. Now she wrestled Liv Morgan and I would say that Liv Morgan was the lesser of the two uh, uh, on the, in that match. If if, if I was because I was I was watching really closely because I knew that I was a little negative towards Nia, and I was like, okay, I want to make sure that I'm just not being biased towards her. And yeah, she's not she's not fantastic, but she does some things very well. I thought Liv was was off last night for uh, for yeah. whatever reason. And that match could have been better if she was a little bit more on. Because I think Nia probably, just because she probably heard some of the criticism, she's like, okay, I got to make some of this stuff look a little bit more, a little bit better for Liv. Liv's a lot smaller. And then Liv was kind of fumbling the ball a little bit. So I, you know, I, I, I'm hard on, on Nia Jax, but I felt after watching closely yesterday, I made sure I, did, I don't want to be biased towards anybody. Like you're just, we're just talking about it. We're critiquing. Um, and, you know, as fans, not that I've actually ever been in the ring and took a bump or anything, but uh, so I just wanted to make sure that I gave her the benefit. And and I think I, w I think I was fair in, in my review, but I was just I was just interested because I've seen wide ranging scores like uh, Brian Alvarez was harder on Nia than I was. And then I've seen other people say, you know, I think a big Vinny V who we had on in our Q&A last week, he was like, that was a fantastic main event. And I won't take any answer otherwise. And I've had other people go like, you know, it was a near four star match. I was like, really? I what did I miss? But, you know, yeah. it's just wide ranging, wide ranging stuff. No, I agree with you. I I, I not the best performance, but I, I think the uh, Monday definitely was was not great. Uh, I don't know what happened on Monday, but on um, on on Saturday show, um, it was what I expected. I didn't expect yeah. more. So maybe my very straight maybe my, forward book show. Yeah. Yeah. I, maybe for me, it was a little bit different. What did you think of the Cody and Seth and Grayson Waller Austin Theory segment? I hate those segments. <laughs> I hate those talking segments. Uh, it's not the Piper's Pit. It's not 1990 anymore. Everybody. Ha I hate the, the Waller effect. I hate the Kevin Owens show. Yeah. I hated the Chris Jericho one. Uh, whoever else is doing them, the Miz TV, the I Miz hate all TV. of them. There's, it's done so often where it doesn't even make sense to do it. Just mm -hmm. come out there, cut a promo, and be interrupted. You know, you're, yeah. you're, it's just bizarre to me that, you know, it's a variety show, and, and they tend to do that a lot. Um, I, I didn't like it at all. I understand that you know it's set up something for everybody, but uh, not a fan. So you're saying like on. Saturday Night Live, Tina Fey shouldn't just bring out a whiteboard that says the Tina Fey show, which is the same whiteboard. That... <laughs> That's literally exactly what yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I the the whole segment was to set up whatever The Rock and, and Roman are going to say, which is why last night I kind of thought now, you know, I'm sure Dwayne is uh, racking up the miles on that private jet because he's going to all these wrestling shows. But I, I kind of wish that he was actually at Raw last night because I think there would have been a much better thread. Because if you have Saturday, so you had you, so you had two Fridays ago, and The Rock uh, slaps, uh, uh, he didn't slap Cody. Uh, no, the, the press conference, he slaps Cody. So then he's on SmackDown, and they do the whole bloodline thing with him and Roman. And then you have the elimination chamber where Cody accepts. Now we're kind of waiting for, okay, what does Rock say? So on Monday, Cody has to go back out and say again that he wants the Rock. And so there was no retribution or there was no answer from the Rock naturally. So now we got to wait another show to get him to answer. So I thought he should have been 
on Raw. And I'm sure that they would have probably wanted him on Raw if they could give it him on Raw. But instead, we got Paul Heyman coming out to uh, tell some very slow stories because they had like 10 minutes left after Cody easily beat Grayson. And I looked at my watch and I was like, oh, man, we got a lot of time here. And Paul Heyman meandered down the ringside. No human being could walk as slowly as Paul Heyman walked down the aisle. And Boy, then was he, he cut his... time. Oh, my gosh. He cut his promo. Cody got in the ring, sat down. Uh, AJ Kirsch was uh, one of Heyman's henchmen. Uh, people would remember hey, AJ Hirsch. I guess, I don't know if people remember this. Do you remember when AJ Kirsch was part of the what was it the yolo county tag team champions yolo like... county tag team titles i have those titles they're in my <laughs> attic i have a set of the yolo county tag titles literally in my attic right now i just moved it out of the studio i, I would have gone up there it was sitting there for years nobody brought it up this is the first time anybody's ever brought it up <laughs> so aj That's kirsch wild. and uh, a friend of uh a friend of mine and a really really good friend of uh John LaRocca's Dave Dutra, who's also an indie guy out this way. They were the Yolo County Tag Team Champions. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if, if you know, if you're from this area, you know, AJ, you've seen AJ um, that AJ has been in multiple angles like that on WWE TV before. And so it's funny when when he came out and I was like, oh, this is awesome. I, I love it when you get to see the folks who are, you know, wrestling around this this area in, in independence it's kind of cool to see them be there uh actually uh i i don't know if you would have seen this but i think I, i'm trying to think of, i think it's during the nakamura match there were there was a, a little dude a uh, blonde kid and he, the, he like he was messing with nakamura or something and like that kid is the son of the guy who runs apw in in this area uh who had he had the you know the the the, the super super front row so it's like fun to see that you know then you see the people who are like at the indie shows and, and such but by the way jay uso was at a like cricket wireless store somewhere in san jose and i like i didn't know about this but it was like around noon uh monday and so i was told by some folks who went to go see if they could get a jay uso autograph that people were in line waiting for hours before he even got there. And oh it kind of became uh, an S show, as, as I was told. And they just had him eventually sign a bunch of stuff to give out because it was a little bit too chaotic. So that kind of tells you a little bit how hot wrestling is right now, at least WWE in this area, because they sold out completely last night. I haven't, I haven't been to a WWE show with that many people since uh the night after wrestlemania 31 that was the last time in this area that there was that many people for a wrestling show that i can remember I, I, now there there may I, have been a pay-per-view that they've done that i didn't go to but for for me how many people were there in there just under twelve thousand, which was a sellout so like the upper deck was i would full. say i would say for wwe uh i, I mean i i was i mean i i've been to like the state the stadium shows, which I'm not going to count that, but for like a SmackDown, I was there at the Garden, and they had thirteen thousand plus in that building. Yeah, you know, I think I I don't remember the exact number, but I, maybe that TV had like fifteen thousand or whatever it was. Um, they are. It is amazing how much business they're doing with a whole lot so, of nothing. And so, if I go back, because so this is the third RAW that I've been to live in a year, and we went through this whole thing. You go back a year on this show when i was telling you how i had stopped going to raw shows because i found them to be very boring live and then my buddy told me hey you do you want to go and i was like okay and i had a lot of fun this would have been this time last year and i was like oh they do a much better job of keeping the audience involved during commercial time and you know things happening so that you're never really sitting on your hands and so this is the third raw in a in a year and the first time this year or this time last year i i want to say there was like maybe a, a seven thousand and then six months ago there was maybe like nine so it's like incrementally growing going up by 
two thousand in the last three shows over over the calendar year. Let me which ask is you this: crazy. I want to ask you this, uh, because because this is such a interesting what if, right? If Cody had not gone to WWE, and mm -hmm. Punk had not had the uh, the travesty that he had in his run, where would AEW be today? Cody never leaves. Punk is, you know, kumbaya and happy to be there as far as, you know, TV is concerned. Do you see a shift in the balance at all on the WWE side or is WWE still on the same trajectory or does AEW still, you know, do they still do the same exact thing that they're doing or are they performing better? No, I think AEW stays hotter. I think WWE, they do not catch as much fire but i think you know and we kind of circle back to austin being at wrestlemania again like we kind of yeah. circle back to that time frame as like oh like there's like interest there like who we haven't seen steve austin wrestle in years and years and years cody was also on that show and he was the he so you know i think we had all assumed he was going to be there you know we'd been talking about it but steve austin drove those eyeballs to the to the bigger oh, big picture time. so that yeah. cody could people could see cody so i think that was uh the austin thing they would have had to have somebody else in that cody role to take advantage of that i don't know who that would have been because remember the main event of that weekend was lesnar and and roman reigns um yeah uh, on night two so it, it's not going to be roman reigns that there would had to be a baby face to take advantage of the eyeballs that Cody Rhodes got that weekend. Uh, so I know, I mean, unless they had somebody else who, who would it have been? I can't even think going back, you know, a couple years now, but I think a AEW does not fall out as much. And it's probably because of the optics of one of their EVPs leaving. Like, I think that, even like it's not really the direct effect of of Cody um, leaving as a wrestler. It's the direct effect of AEW was perceived as the cool and hot. And then one of their own guys who started the company left. And that kind of changed that perception uh, of what they were. So that that's interesting. You know, you know, what's going to be interesting. Who's going to write that book about all of the things that happened during that time frame? Because that you I, know, I, I think it's so there's so much that has happened in pro wrestling from post pandemic from that, like pre that mania to actually that January right to now. And it's still unfolding. Everything is unfolding. Well, you, you know, Dave's story, right? Dave's story that the Steve Austin news from that WrestleMania broke to him when he was on a valentine's day dinner dave was on dave was out on a date for valentine's day and and steve austin and, calls he's like and, dave listen what <laughs> <laughs> and that's when he got the text for that for that time he, he well, uh, valentine's day will always he'll always remember that as the day that he got the steve austin news i uh, I'll never forget the moment that they figured out that I knew that Danielson and Adam Cole were going to be on that show in Chicago. And he grabbed me in a corner and lifted me with his big muscle arms. And he said, <laughs> you fucking tell me now. And he started shaking me violently. <laughs> never forget that. I was traumatized. I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to be there. He's going to be there. Um, oh, man. I, I, you know, listen, I, I, Steve Austin was a big thing for them. You know, uh, yeah. I, I want to see Steve do more. I, and I'm one of the few, like, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm, I Austin's the best at that stuff. How do man. you not want to see that? And he did so good with Kevin Owens. I want to see him and punk. That's the match I want. And then well, the I thing can never see a CM Punk match. I can never see an Austin match again. If, if that's the last one, I'm fine. Well, I think. As long as the rock is there he knows that he's not needed right like he doesn't want to be overshadowed by the rock and you know what's you know what's actually interesting he would not be overshadowed by the rock right now because the rock's getting booed like austin would be celebrated right now so it'd be actually an interesting yeah. time for him to come back but you know he if he was to do another match and he's not you know he's never one to say 
this is the, this can never happen. Like he did that Kevin Owens match, and I'm sure he could do just as safe of a match with CM Punk. You know, he's tell he's gonna tell that dude, I'm not going up for no GTS though, brother. That's not happening. Uh, oh, but and he, he, but he's like he's he weighs he's like a sack of rocks. I don't know if Punk <laughs> could get him up. I think Punk would have an easier time getting Lesnar up than Steve at this point. <laughs> he's so dense, you know. Uh, here's a question for you: Do you think? Okay, I'll throw it out there. I do you can you see Rock and Austin doing anything together? Yeah, whether whether on a or, team or, is that or ship sail. Or, or, I think it's it sailed because you got. I think you got to leave it where it was, right? Because you had three WrestleMania matches. WWE's created so much content off of that feud, off of those matches. You leave it where it is, and you don't possibly soil the the memory of that feud. And just yeah, leave it where it is. I mean, they could do. Um, you know what? I would actually like to see. And this is where I hope if they have some time with The Rock, what they should be doing. I hope that they're doing some interviews with him because you could do fun stuff like Austin and rock talking about their feud and why it was important. And you could create, you know, WrestleMania, uh, weekend 24 seven or whatever, whatever they call it. 360, whatever, whatever that, that little documentary thing that they sometimes do on Peacock austin versus the rock and you have those guys talking about their feud and their matches like you, you, they sh i hope they're doing stuff like that because you yeah. don't have the opportunity to have rock in house to do a lot of this stuff so i hope they take advantage of it because that stuff is that's the stuff that i would love to see like even you know rock and roman is great rock and cody is great i don't need to see another actual Dwayne the rock johnson wrestling match i just like seeing him because he's bigger than life and he's like you're you know, he's the celebrity that came from this thing that we watch that no, a lot a lot of people watch. And so when you see him become the big star, you, it's kind of like a wink and a nod to us because yeah. we're like, man, we you know, we we were there before everybody else was with with Dwayne. So I like that aspect of it. I don't need to see him wrestle, but I would love to see him talk about the history and talk about Austin and talk about um, Triple H and do these things like I'm talking about him speaking about it, not the talking head stuff like we see on that WWE rivals show. Like I don't need, I don't yeah. need John Bradshaw Layfield to pretend that he even knew what was going on during that time. Right. I mean, and some <laughs> of the stuff, he, some of the, some of the stuff he was actually there for, but I'm talking about the other stuff where he's just like making up stuff. And he's just like, you know, very speaking in generalities. And I'm just like, come on, give, give us some insight. That's what you're there for. But he doesn't, he doesn't have it for everything. So I like, I would love to see those guys do stuff like that. And I hope they're doing, it. I hope they're sitting Dwayne down and going, dude, just need you for two hours just to talk about this. That would be cool. Yeah. I, I, I'm looking forward to what they're doing, especially with Dwayne. Uh, we still don't know about night one. Is it him and Cody? Are they, are they getting away from the mix? You know, from the, from the, from the tag match? I don't know. Uh, I don't want to see that tag match. I don't want to see Cody <laughs> wrestle twice, uh, where it's, you know, you got to wrestle rock first to get to Roman. You know, I don't want to see that. Um, uh, I think you, yeah. you, you, well, wrestle, okay. you lessen the value. Okay. What if they said Rock versus Cody night one stipulation is winner gets Roman? What if they did it that way? And and what? Uh, Rock wins? Rock's got to take the L. He's got to take the L to Cody. I don't want to. I don't think. Listen, I, I am. I am the I am the odd person out here. I don't want to see Cody and Roman. I don't want to see it. I want to see Rock and Roman. If you have an opportunity to do it now, you better do it now. You don't know okay, what a year what, brings but, you. But what if the agreement is that after this year, after this WrestleMania, all of next year is getting to Rock and Roman, and then we just get it but, at 41? Okay. Great. Fine. If, if things are still hot, right? If mm -hmm. Rock is healthy and Roman is healthy and things are still firing on all cylinders— it's going to be diminished. The value of that match is going to be totally diminished if you wait another year and the product is not as hot. This is the hottest that the product has ever been. I know there's a lot of people that tell you will say, hey, it's not needed because it's so hot. But this is, you know, we've waited so long for this match. 
We, I'm saying as a whole, right? As far as yeah. people that are interested in it. I'm one of those few people. Some people really don't want to see this match. And I totally understand why you don't want to see it. For me, I want to see it. I get Cody's story, but you got a chance to do something really big here. Or mm -hmm. they think they could do it again. I, and if that's the case, then, then if they, they know better than me, you know, they could do it. But I have lost confidence in this company for over the 30 some odd years that I've been a fan of it. For them to commit to storytelling, captivative storytelling over the long term, that has me interested. When they announced that rock match a year in advance, I hated it. I didn't want it. There was no element of surprise. I, I yeah. don't want to wait a year for that. I get some people want to. And listen, I could be wrong on this. It could still be the hottest thing next year at WrestleMania. They could announce it and, and continue to feud and do this whole thing. But once Roman loses that title and a year has gone by and he's not on TV every week, what does that mean now? What does that rock match mean? You've already shown that you, you, you've lost. You're, you're, you know, are you still at the same level that you were a year prior? I don't know. Listen, I, I, I'm speculating here. It could be fantastic. I know Cody has to finish that goddamn story. <laughs> I know that that's, a, I'm tired of hearing about it. I want to <laughs> see him become the guy. I want to see him win that title, but what's a bigger story? Okay. Now, if you look at this from a defensive perspective, you said, that Rock versus Roman, by not doing it now, the the where the business is this time next year could be different, and thus it won't mean as much. And I completely understand that. But if you take out the Rock and you put R Cody in that same formula, isn't that more damaging to current business if Cody versus Roman you hold off for another year and then you're in the same boat that it's not as hot as it is right now. Like, what is the I mean, lesser of the two evils there? The, uh, why not at SummerSlam? Why can't you do it at SummerSlam? You know, Co uh, Roman beats The Rock in that ring. He really is the man. Mm -hmm. And here comes Cody at SummerSlam or any other show, and he, and he dethrones him. You know, you, does, does Cody winning the title of WrestleMania versus SummerSlam or, uh, you know, any of the, let's say SummerSlam. Because that's a big MSG, thing. baby. Uh, I wanted it at MSG. Uh, you know what? His dad never did it at the Garden. What if after all of this, he still loses? <laughs> <laughs> people are going. I kind of to... want him to now. <laughs> I know people. Just people to are see going the reaction. to go crazy. They're going just to, to see go the reaction. Crazy. No, I, I think it's going to be tremendous. I mean, we're having fun here, but I I don't like seeing people suffer. I don't like seeing people. Uh, diminish their value, especially in professional wrestling. It's a very short career in the longevity of things. I want to see Cody do as well as possible. But I also, I have my own opinions on things that I want to see. And that's yeah. fun to kind of speculate. Him winning that title at WrestleMania will be such a tremendous story for him and his legacy and his family and what it means to him. Uh, I hope it means a lot to the audience. I hope that it creates a growth period. But you are coming off one of the greatest runs of a world champion ever in that company. I'll end with this. I know we're a couple of minutes over. Sorry, producer John. At the end of the show last night, so he beats Grayson. They do the whole thing with Heyman and the henchmen and everything. And so they cut the cameras off. Cody cuts a promo and thanks San Jose and XYZ does the whole thing, the whole baby face thing, the whole reason why he's the perfect person for that role. And one of the uh, one of the camera guys, I think it's one of the camera guys. It could have been somebody else, but just kind of sends him a message. And he's like, Cody's like, huh, really? OK, well, bring it over here. So somebody had a envelope with the results of their gender reveal for their child. I their saw soon that. to be born child. And they had Cody read the results uh, in the ring. And so they did. I, I, I know WWE actually put a produced version of that segment uh, on their I think it's on their Twitter. I, I think I also I, I shot the whole thing. So I have it on the fight game media uh, Twitter as well. But people eat that stuff up. I had so many people retweet the video that I posted as in like 
Cody is the best human I've ever seen in life. Like that's the kind of reaction he got to that simple thing. So I, I just thought that I, you know, this is why having a top baby face works. It is for moments like that. When your top uh, person is a heel and you yeah. don't have the over baby faces, you don't get moments like that. So all that to say, if Cody gets finished his story, wins that title he doesn't even really have to hold that title for very long because he's sort of cemented he he goes into that john cena role and if you think about it we went from austin who had a really short stay on top the rock triple h then we got cena and cena was like that connective tissue until they tried to make roman that guy and roman did not work as that guy but they got that guy now, and that yeah. is Cody. And if he has to win that title to cement that, and then again, he doesn't have to keep it. He, you know, he's having him as a as the champion, the babyface champion, might actually make him a little bit more stale than without the title. But that that's why he's in the spot that he's in. That is how the people react to him. So uh, I, I saw that right, you know, right in front of me last night, and it just really cemented my thoughts that. You have the opportunity to make this guy who's going to carry the company as the baby face, as the one who's going to be able to go on TV, as the one who's going to be able to get in front of the live crowd to do the stuff for the, the fan base. That's why he's there and he has been perfect. And you just got to finally tell the rest of that story and then we move on. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm curious how long he holds that title. I can't imagine it's for that long. I don't know. Maybe he holds it for for like six months to a year. Yeah, that would that'd be fine. And then you yeah. set up the next big, you know, the next heel. Yeah, and whatever it is. There's gonna be baby faces coming after him, and he's gonna be like the the guy who just the mere fact that he wrestles with this other baby face, the other baby face gets made. Like that's gonna be his role. So, yeah. and to think AW had that dude right. Going back to our previous Wild. conversation, that Wild. and he was never allowed to have that title. Remember, no, he was he barred yeah. from becoming the champion there. Yeah, you got to overrule that one, Terrible. TK, buddy. All right, yeah. that is it from here. Thanks for hanging out with us for a couple more extra minutes. Uh, I think we're going to be back. I'm pretty sure. I don't have anything, though my schedule may change in the near future. We've had some uh, some changes at the company with, with leadership, so I don't know. We'll see. I'll, I'll have to keep Andrew in the loop on things, but... As far as I know, I will be back next week. So uh, thank you to everybody for watching and listening. For Andrew, I am Double G. We will see you when we see you. Peace out.